bonjour à tous. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on a choisi d'aborder un sujet très important qui est celui de la PAC et des potentielles dérives autour de la PAC. Euh, chaque année, l'Union européenne dépense plus de 60 milliards d'euros en subventions agricoles pour soutenir les agriculteurs de l'Union européenne. Euh, cet argent. To support, uh, European farmers. And this money is destined for farmers and producers. But unfortunately, um, a few big players get hold of the bulk of the money. And a few of the founding nations of uh, the European Union uh, are currently being exploited by those. Uh, and they are heavily represented uh, within the European Parliament. And they form a block from the inside. And the CAP was a very useful tool in the past. But unfortunately, it does no longer meet the uh, challenges of these times. And that's um, food security. There's also climate change, uh, inequalities, and uh, the relaunch. Because we, we uh, of course, have to take into account all the, the things that happened concerning COVID-19. And therefore, we have to also fight um, against conflicts of interest. All of those have to be tackled uh, in order to tackle the, the problems uh, with the cap. And um, thanks to our interpreters, I hope you can follow um, my speech in, uh, in English translation. Um, during the live stream, it will be mixed, but uh, during the replay, you can uh, select one channel. And given uh, the importance of the topic, I think it's important that we uh, allow people to take the floor in the two main languages, English and French. I would like to introduce uh, our hosts, our speakers, Matt Apuzzo, uh, double winner of the Pulitzer Prize, um, author, acclaimed author in the New York Times, and he'll um, briefly describe his work for the New York Times. And then uh, a man with a very difficult uh, surname, to pronounce Alex Brenningmeyer, I hope uh, that was more or less correct. Um, and he'll uh, talk about how the EU can take back uh, control over cap fundings. And then there's uh, a number of MEPs who will um, give a testimonial. Uh, Lara Walters of uh, SND Group, Clotilde Armand, bilingual, uh, by the way. My uh, colleague and friend Francisco Guerrero uh, from Portugal, uh, in the same group as myself, Greens EFA. And he will uh, talk about uh, animal welfare. And then uh, I would like to thank all the staff members who made this uh, webinar possible. I'll pass the floor to Emily. She will be our moderator. We are very glad with her presence here today. Uh, we know she's been very active for media part um, on, on agricultural topics. And she kindly in, in accepted uh, our invitation to moderate this uh, discussion. So Emily, I suggest you take the floor. And uh, I'll see you all back for the final wrap-up. Emily, you have to switch on your microphone. Thank you, Benoit Abuto, for this introduction. So, common agriculture policy and corruption, how to put an end to the lack of transparency. This is the topic of today. This is not only interesting in itself. This is also a topic related to the European news. We are in the beginning of the renegotiation of the CAP for the next period, 2021-2027. Uh, and a few days ago, the Commission made a new proposal with a budget actually a bit higher than it was expected. 
that is to say 390 billions of euros, which is not far from the budget of the previous years, despite the Brexit. But the question is how this money, which is public money, that is to say the money that, uh, of the taxpayers of the European Union, how this money will be distributed and will it be affected with the same rules than before? Until now, there were already a lot of frauds, a lot of problems in the affectation of this money. And this policy had a lot of consequences. And this is, among other things, what showed the investigation made by the New York Times last autumn, enrichment of businessmen, sometimes of politicians, land grabs, reinforcement of an industrial agriculture that causes pollution and destroys biodiversity how this policy could change, meet better our environmental challenges and be better in terms of equity and transparency. How this policy could preserve a way of production that is fair for farmers, workers and consumers. How could we avoid the conflicts of interest between politician leaders and beneficiaries of the European subventions? These are some of the questions that I would like to ask you today. My first question will be addressed to Matt Apuzzo, one of the authors of the investigation of the New York Times. So Matt, you wrote in your articles about Hungary. You described how some people around the Prime Minister Viktor Orban bought rapidly a lot of agricultural lands and could massively benefit from the European subventions. So please tell us what the cap has caused specifically in the post-communist countries of Central Europe. And then secondly, I would like you to tell us also the difficulties that you met during this work. Sure, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, so I just would like to say from the beginning, I, I came at this not as a, I'm not an activist. Uh, I'm not an environmentalist. I don't have uh, an agenda. Um, I, I, I love I love a good steak. I'm not trying to change anybody's eating habits. Um, just coming at this as a journalist who said uh, 60 billion dollars a year or so, 60 billion euros a year or so uh, is being spent, the largest chunk of European money. And I, I kind of just the curiosity I had was where well, where is that going? Um, are the subsidies aligning with the EU stated goals on the environment? The EU has positioned itself as a leader. Uh, is the EU putting its money where its mouth is? Unfortunately, the setup uh, of the European Commission makes it essentially impossible to answer those questions. Um, and I came away from a year of reporting convinced that this is entirely by design. Um, so when you ask people where the money's going, uh, the commission rightly says, hey, we require every member state to disclose its recipients, and they tend to leave it there. And that's true on the face of it. But when you hear that, just remember that if you own your land through a company, a uh, shell company, an LLC, a partnership, you're not trackable. So if I go on to even a really good uh, public disclosure website, like I'd say Ireland has a pretty good one, um, I have to know how the person I'm looking at has organized corporately their structure uh, in order to find out what subsidies are going to them. Further, there's no way for me to find out what land is being subsidized. And of course, we all know Pillar 1 money is, uh, is the biggest chunk of change in the cap. And that's going, that's a land-based payment. And when you're looking at, are we subsidizing uh, the environmental practices we want to be, there should be a way for the public to, uh, to say, all right, well, what land is being subsidized and how much? But there is no way to do that. We talk to MEPs. I see some of uh, some people who, uh, on the list I've talked to. We talk to commission members, auditors. We talk to people who train member states. And we asked everybody, hey, does anybody who's setting the subsidy policy does anybody actually have the ability to know who's benefiting from these subsidies? Does anybody who's setting the policy actually have the ability to know which plots of land are being subsidized? And the answer is always no. Um, now, 
the European Commission does maintain an audit database that could match subsidies to plots of land. Originally, they told us, no, there is no such database. And then ultimately, they said, yeah, yeah, we have it, but it's, we can't extract the data you want from the database. Our audit data is just too big. Now, setting aside the question of why the European Commission invested in a database that doesn't allow you to extract the data, it made us wonder, how good is this audit database if you can't easily drill down on the actual recipients in the land? So the European Commission denied our request. They wouldn't give us the data. And we took it to the ombudsman, who agreed that there is this huge transparency gap because of the secrecy of the commission. Uh, but they said the commission's right. They cannot be forced to write a program to extract the data uh, from their very big database that can't be used to extract data. So we, we can't force them to do it. So we move forward anyways. Um, we move forward in the absence of the data. And as everybody here knows, uh, the former Soviet states, the, uh, these, these giant collective farms that are relics from the Soviet era, when they joined the EU, those giant collective farms became essentially cash cows because of the pillar one, the way pillar one, one money goes out, because it goes out based on hectares. Um, whoever controlled the big chunk of land would control a big chunk of subsidies. And what we saw was in Hungary, for instance, the government auctioned off those state-owned lands over the years. Now, getting the record for those auctions and the land registration is pretty damn hard in Hungary. Um, and frankly, we would have been completely unable to do it if not for Viktor Orban's former agricultural undersecretary, uh, a huge believer in, uh, um, in the European project and in European subsidies and in the cap. And he helped us get the land records. And so what we did is we went to uh, Fehar County, um, which is Viktor Orban's um, home county. And we said, uh, we said essentially, um, who here is getting the um, uh, who here is getting the uh, the subsidies? And what we did, if I can see here, um, am I getting where am I? Is everybody seeing? Where are people seeing my email? Or are people seeing? Hang on. Um, let's try this one more time. Uh, share my screen. Okay, so this is a story we ran. Uh, I'll send a link in the chat here. Um, and what we did, it's we went and we mapped Victor Orban's home county. And using the records that we got from the individual land sales, we were able to show, you know, about 1500 hectares of land that went to uh, Victor Orban's childhood friend, uh, Lawrence Mezaros and his family. Um, we were able to find 500 hectares or so that went to a business partner of Victor Orban's wife. We were able to find um, land that went about 600 hectares that went to Victor Orban's son-in-law and his family. Um, all in all, we were able to identify about 28 million uh, euros that went to two oligarchs uh, just in the last year through European farm subsidies. Now. That's just what we were able to find because um, these these companies hide between behind uh, behind shell companies. Um, obviously, the disclosure is all up to national governments, and they don't make it easy in Hungary. Um, so uh, that's the that's the sort of first article that we um, we wrote. Obviously, it's no secret that this is going on. Uh, in 2015, the European Parliament commissioned a report asking about uh, land grabbing. Uh, they actually said, hey, somebody should look at Fehar County in Hungary. It seems like maybe some weird stuff is going on. Uh, the European Commission uh, came down very hard on that report and said that it was bad science and that there's no definition of what land grabbing is. Um, and uh, it's too anecdotal. Um, but of course, there's no way to study it because they won't make the data available. So all you have is the anecdote. So what we tried to do is try to study it as close as we can. Um, we are also able to identify more than 40 million euros that went to uh, Andre Babish in the Czech Republic. 
Uh, his uh, agriculture minister also gets, uh, his family also gets subsidies, and there's no conflict of interest provisions uh, with the council. So Babish and the agricultural minister can sit on the, uh, on the council and vote on subsidies, just like you can in the European Parliament. If you receive subsidies, you can set, so you can vote on subsidies. Um, uh, and then just really briefly, I'm mean, literally like 10 seconds, I, I would, I would also say the best, I would love to see more data available um, on uh, land being subsidized, Whoops, sorry, down land being subsidized because um, I think you can't do a proper environmental analysis. Um, this is Brittany in the, in the Northwest of France. Um, you can't do a proper environmental analysis beyond like this sort of regional analysis that you're seeing here without the actual records. Um, so this is this is runoff uh, nitrate pollution and subsidies by large tracts of land, um, but doesn't allow you to actually look at owner level. But I want to show you this one thing that was super cool. We were able to track just looking in like Poland. We we're able to track nitrate runoff in and into the Baltic Sea, and map it out against every uh, every farm in Poland, and also where that feeds to dead zones. And then we also were able to map every waterway in the European Union uh, that is has nitrate pollution coming off of farms. So you can see those little red lines there are the polluted waterways um, of Europe uh, polluted by farms. We would love to have been able to match this up to indiv individual farms and farm practices and see how much money uh, is being spent uh, for these farm practices, but the European Commission uh, and member states make that impossible. Um, so I'm just here to say, uh, I hope everybody reads this, this story. I think it's really interesting. And I think, uh, um, you know, more, more data on this uh, would allow us to do even better work going forward. Thank you, Matt. So this is a very rich work uh, that has uh, also an env environmental aspect, as you just explained us. Um, Alex brenick Meyer, uh, you are a member of the European Court of Auditors, an institution that was established in uh, 1975 in Luxembourg in order to improve EU financial management. So if we speak about corruption in the CAP, the European Court of Auditors is an instrument to improve this policy. Please tell us, did the court already make some reports or warnings towards the CAP? And how could the EU take back control over the CAP fundings? Thank you, uh, Amélie. And thank you very much for organizing this very important webinar. And I feel pretty excited being next to Matt Apuzzo and also Emily, uh, you as a journalist, investigative uh, journalist, but because I must admit that uh, investigative uh, journalism is a very important contribution in uh, uncovering uh, uh, fraud and, and corruption. And for that reason, I believe it's, it's extremely important that this New York Times article and also other uh, results of uh, investigative uh, journalism uh, present a picture which is quite confrontational. And I must admit that the New York Times uh, article uh, sparked discussion within the Court of Auditors in the sense the question comes up to what extent we as a formal institution of the European Union are able to support the uh, the, the war against uh, corruption and, uh, and fraud. And we have seen, and I believe that Matt Apuzzo has uh, put it quite uh, precisely, that uh, it's extremely important that there is transparency and that there is a free access to documents and information in Europe. And that this uh, transparency and free access to, to documents uh, uncovers also the quality of good governance in, uh, in not only in Brussels, but on member states level, because most things happen on level, member states level. If it comes to the big, bigger picture, and it's, uh, it's an issue we are dealing with at the Court of Auditors, we must identify that the, the CAP, the uh, uh, agricultural policy is in fact an expression of a very old model of approach of 
supporting member states, especially supporting farmers. Uh, and as um, uh, Matt Apuzzo has, uh, has mentioned it, in fact, now it creates cash cows in the sense that there are large companies uh, who get a lot of money. And uh, uh, the question is, uh, is this a contribution to a good development of agriculture? And many, many uh, questions are related with this, questions also on sustainability and uh, uh, Matt also illustrated uh, the pervert effects of European uh, subsidies. So the main question is, should we continue with the cap in this way? And how can we improve the, uh, the effect of the cap if it comes to uh, sustainable uh, development? Not only sustainable development on the, on the level of agriculture, but also on the level of society. Because if we uh, go into uh, uh, to, to several member states and ask people, what is your feeling about the efforts of the European Union if it comes to the development of, then they can be very bitter in the sense that they say, well, the rich people get more money and uh, we are not helped with, uh, with European action. So if there is a debate about the future of the multi-annual financial framework, is there a future uh, discussion about the future of the cup, we should take into account the perspective of EU citizens who uh, do not have always a reason to be very happy with uh, what's happening. Um, there are too many hidden beneficiaries if it comes to the cup. Uh, there is fraud, there is abuse of, uh, of funds, and there are people who are able to play the system and to fill their uh, pockets. And that's, that's really an, an, an awful, uh, awful issue. This all is on the level what I would, would identify the macro level. The, the main questions on a high abstract level is, are related with the system of the cup and the influence of the cup, uh, the agriculture policy on a member state level. And uh, I believe on this level, uh, the most important question is uh, follow the money. And that's in fact what uh, Matapuzzo and others did, follow the money, who is beneficiary of, uh, of it. And uh, if there are problems, then we should reflect on the future of, of the system. But besides the macro level, we can also identify the meso level. And the major level is about the development on member state level of these kinds of systems. And then we have to look at the conditionality in the uh, discussions on the multi-annual financial framework. Uh, we talk about conditionality in the sense that we can give money, but there should be some conditions under which the money can be spent. And this conditionality should be uh, uh, relate with good administration, the development of good administration on member state level, because the commission can only control limited uh, the, the execution of the programs. It is on member states level, which is relevant. And also uh, the functioning of the rule of law. The rule of law should be a real safeguard against abuse of, uh, of money and uh, lack of transparency and also uh, uh, fraud and uh, uh, corruption. Uh, there should be state-based and even region-based region systems that have a pre uh, preventive effect if it comes to uh, spending of EU uh, money. Repression in the sense of uh, criminal charges, et cetera, et cetera, is important, but it starts all with uh, prevention. So anti-corruption and anti-fraud starts with uh, prevention and prevention is based on good administrative uh, systems. And this brings me to the third level, macro, meso, and now the micro level. On the micro level, we have to reflect on the future of digitalization and with digitalization, access to information for all. There is no EU-owned or state-owned information on these kinds of funds. It should be public information. It should be always open, not only to journalists, to the media, to all citizens. 
Secondly, on the micro level, the tone at the top. Cheating the system, playing the system, and maybe popul populist voices which are connected with this approach, it's abnormal, it's abuse of the system. The tone of the top should be the tone of the rule of law. The tone at the top should be the tone of good governance. The tone at the top should be the tone of prevention and also related with the issue of uh, sustainability and uh, protection of the environment, etc., etc. Thirdly, on the micro level, and then I return to the beginning of my introduction, the media. The media are extremely important in combating uh, uh, the problems in the sense that from the perspective of the Court of Auditors, we can contribute, we can do research, we can make uh, important uh, reports and we can make recommendations to uh, the, the European Commission. But in addition, uh, the media are extremely important. The, the role of the Court of Auditors is mostly backward looking. We are sometimes invited to give some opinions. Uh, in our backward looking way, we, we should not only focus on the criminal issues, it's about good governance. So we should identify what are good governance issues on, uh, on a member state level. The performance is extremely important, more important even than regularity and legality of the spendings. It's the follow the money. Where does the money land and is it well spent? Um, and as a summary of this, the quintessence is good governance on member state level. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so you spoke about following the money. That is uh, the question, actually. You spoke uh, about conditionality, about the respect of the rule of law. Uh, these are thematics that we will continue to debate after with the uh, members of, uh, of the parliament that are with us. So thank you for your uh, contribution. Um, now, Lara Volters, uh, you are a member of the Parliament, of the European Parliament. You belong to the group of the Social Democrats and SND, and you are also a member of the intergroup anti-corruption. We saw uh, before with Mata Puzo that uh, Hungary is a bad example of the use of the European subvention. But there is also another example, which is Andrei Babiš, the Prime Minister of Czech Republic. This man is also a businessman who made his success in the sector of agriculture. Each year, his business receives dozens of millions of European money. How could we avoid this kind of conflict of interest and how the European Union should fight against this? Yeah. Well, if only if only we knew if only we had a, a clear cut answer and uh, and we could all go home but uh, but that is going to be a huge challenge um, having gone to the Czech Republic to see how subtly uh, Andrei Babiš was was able to influence politics when he was still a businessman and vice versa how subtly he's able to influence business now that he's a politician um, I think that puts the finger on the sore point immediately because that subtlety of what goes on sometimes is I think what makes it so hard to tackle. Um, we're speaking about fraud sometimes and fraud is, is, is breaking the law and there are usually there's, there's, there's enforcement, there's legal consequences, but when something is not illegal but maybe undesirable or where there's a gray area, it's very, very difficult um, for us to say this is what needs to be done. And I think it all starts in those cases with at least um, putting a spotlight on those situations. So at least saying, look, this is going on. We all need to be aware of this because this looks shady. And I think there um, immediately also, I come to, to um, the point already, um, already um, mentioned by, by, by the colleagues here, which is the role of investigative journalism and how important that is for that part of the work. Um, so um, I just want to make sure I don't forget to, to thank Matt Apuzzo also for his work thus far. Um, I also imagine that that sort of work is not without risks sometimes. Um, and I was thinking about this a little bit, and I think that in the, in the cases of, uh, of, of, of this, so in, in the money farmers piece, but also for Lux Leaks, also for Dieselgate, I think we in the EU needed a push from 
from the outside for us to take action. Um, I think in all three cases, the, uh, the investigations came from, from the US, came from, from outside the EU, and then prompted us to do something with them. Um, and I think that's extremely important. So um, keep, up, keep up the good work and we'll, we'll try to do the same from our side. Um, some of my colleagues also mentioned the anti-EU sentiments. And I think that um, it's very good that we have this debate now, um, even if it is uncomfortable sometimes for pro-European forces, because at the moment during the COVID crisis as well, there's, um, there's those who say that, you know, the EU uh, isn't working as it's supposed to, and it's easy to sort of succumb um, to, uh, to that sort of narrative. And it's, it's, um, it's hard to talk about problems to do with the EU and to do with EU subsidies, because as a pro-European force, you don't want to stain that image of the EU that people might have. But I think that if we don't do that, and if we don't look at our internal kitchen, then others will do it. And I think it's very important for trust in the EU that we do do it and that we don't give ourselves um, a pass because the wider project is, uh, is so important. Um, we've talked a little bit about cap reform. Um, and I was looking at the title of this webinar and what I found um, sad and amusing at the same time is that we're talking about transparency here. But as I mentioned before, um, there's people like Andre Babish who could be very transparent about what they do and still there wouldn't really be any problems. They could say, well, look, you know, this is what goes on in my country. But as I said, that shadow uh, or that, that gray zone, you know, of what's, what's illegal and what's undesirable um, is something that we also need to tackle. So I think we need both better reporting on where the money goes. Um, and Matsapuz has worked on that, of course, and has asked for an opinion of the Ombudsman. So I think that's one part of it. But we also need cap reform and we also need different rules because transparency alone is not going to cut it as long as the rules are too flexible. Um, I have two, two questions that I'll, I'll get to. Um, I know maybe one, one last thing that I wanted to mention in terms of those, those tools, I think cap reform is one of them, um, but the EU financial regulation itself is one too, of course. So we have article 61 there that says that uh, people dealing with EU money shouldn't bring their own interests in conflict with those of the European Union. Um, that article has also allowed the European Commission to start their investigation into Andrei Babish, but I think that in itself is not alone, uh, is, not, is not enough. I think another part, uh, another piece that, that we need here is the rule of law mechanism at EU level, which is being discussed and negotiated in the context of the, uh, of the MFF. Um, and I think that will be very, very important for us to be able to see when there's general discrepancies um, when the Commission sees that, the, that there's the, um, those discrepancies, we can, um, we can stop EU, EU funds being dispersed in those countries. Um, my questions to the two speakers here are um, to Matt. Um, you have talked about the access to information about centralized disclosures um, on where the money goes. I think that's very, very important. Um, but I'd like to see your to have your opinion on what we as legislators can do to amend the, the the rules at the moment. Do you think that disclosure is enough, or do you think that even if there were disclosure, better disclosure, that that would the problems that you came across? Or all member states would have, you know, the uh, the the possibilities internally to do. Um, to, to disclose properly. So that's that's my question to you. And to Alex would be um, whether he could give us our boldest, uh, his, his boldest ideas on cap reform, his boldest ideas on what would need to happen for the cap um, to function better. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think your point on, on corruption is well taken, right? Um, in, in, some of, uh, uh, in some of our stories, we kind of called it soft corruption or rough hewn corruption um, because ultimately if it's the people who are in charge of the government and in charge of where the money's going deciding where the money's going and that money's going to them and their friends if that's if we've made that legal then it's not corrupt um, look I'm not a I'm not a lawmaker um, and I'm not uh, I'm not really in the business of, of telling people what their laws should be uh, but I guess my general view is um, 
that the European Union has built a policy that pays people based on the land they farm and has made it impossible for anybody to see what land is being subsidized under that policy. Now, we have shown and others have shown that, uh, um, that politicians and big businesses and oligarchs and mobsters are milking this uh, system, uh, this opaque system. Um, and we have tried our best in using this opaque system uh, to shine a light and show what was happening. Um, I tend to think that if, uh, if people are upset by that, then they can decide to change it. And if they are not upset by that, uh, um, then they won't change it. And that's, that's democracy. Um, many of the members of parliament that we spoke with uh, along the way in this reporting said, yeah, yeah, no, we know it's like that. But like, we can't get anything passed if we, I mean, we, can, we, we, what, we couldn't change it. We just can't change it. So, um, you know, democracy is we get the, we get the system we all, that we all deserve. So I'm not, I, I, as a reporter, of course, I would like more data. I would like better access to information. I feel like I could do a better job informing the public. Um, but you know, you're an MVP now, you, uh, you decide what the laws are, not me. <laughs> Uh, Alex, uh, Alex, yes. Meta, if you want to answer um, to Lara Volters now. Yes, yeah. I will do it and uh, try to be very brief in the sense that uh, the discussion is more important than uh, my exposure. Um, uh, I believe that the, the, the most uh, powerful step in reforming the cap will be that we stop with uh, the system of um, money seeks projects in the sense that there is always a national envelope. Money goes to the member states and in the member states there are people uh, getting this money and that, that is not a, a, a good contribution to, for instance, sustainable, uh, sustainable development. So we need to reverse the system in the direction of project seeks money and not only uh, in, the, in the form of uh, gifts or subsidies, but also in the form of uh, investments, where we can look at return on investments. If we invest in environment, there should be a return on uh, investment, and that uh, should be uh, important. So, in my view, we should be more radical in Europe, um, and uh, I'm not a politician, I have no political affiliation, maybe I'm too radical to be a politician, but, <laughs> but uh, in fact, we should, um, we should be uh, quite radical in reforming uh, the cap and going into the direction uh, project seeks money instead of money seeks project. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So now uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Clotilde Armand. Uh, Clotilde, you belong to the uh, Renew Group in the European Parliament. You are elected in Romania, as uh, Benoit said it before. Uh, Romania, where uh, corruption is actually a huge problem. Uh, agriculture there is maybe not on the same level of intensity like in the Netherlands or other Western countries, but uh, corruption for sure is uh, at the high level among the, um, the politicians. Uh, do you think that EU should put some conditionality in the affectation uh, of the fundings? If a country doesn't respect the rule of law, uh, nor doesn't respect the principles of the fair uh, affectation of the farm subsidies, should we put an end to the attribution of public money? And if yes, what could be the procedure to do so? I mean, thank you very much. Thank you uh, to all for your uh, very interesting contribution. So yes, I'm coming from Romania. I will first say a few words about Romania, and then I will answer your question, share with you my view on how to fight corruption uh, even more on European agricultural funds. So um, Romania is the last large rural state in Europe. So more than 40% of our population still lives 
in rural areas, mostly living out of agriculture or whose parents were living out of agriculture. So this demographic structure could be a great asset if it was managed correctly. With the Green Deal, we could have a vision of a country with a strong, sustainable agriculture based on family businesses. Um, Romanians, they love their land, they love being farmers, they all have family and roots in the countryside where they return en masse at every occasion. So I believe it is a way of life worth preserving. Unfortunately, what even communism did not manage to do was eventually achieved by wild capitalism, the destruction of Romanian rurality. Today, Romanian villages become deserted because their farmers took work on the Western farms while investment funds, pension funds are buying their land to collect Euro European subsidies and creating huge latifundia. Uh, in Bucharest supermarkets, which have recently appeared, you know, Carrefour, Auchan, Metro, Kaufland, you will find mostly imported fruits and vegetables, ironically cultivated by Romanian farmers cultivated and picked by Romanian farmers in Spain, Italy, Germany, France. So what, what do we want? We want to make sure that with the common agricultural policy, our uh, Romanian farmers can survive and thrive in their farms without migrating to the West or selling their land to investors. And to achieve this, um, uh, there are two uh, ideas that could work. First, to cap the size of farms eligible for EU subsidies, and uh, together with the convergence of subsidies across the EU. I mean, to have the same subsidies wherever you are, so that you don't have farmers migrating to places where you have greater subsidies. So this would be great. Apart from being a great rural state, Romania is well known for its successful, Amelia, I would say successful fight against corruption. So it is now part of our expertise. And we have, we have actually exported this expertise in the person of Laura Kodrutsa Kovici, who is the first European public prosecutor. So my, my point is the following, how can we fight against corruption involving European ag agricultural money? And I, I will try to give you my answer. So the powers of national authorities to investigate financial crimes stop at national borders. Moreover, the EU bodies, Eurojust, Europol, and the EU Anti-Fraud Office, OLAF, they do not have the jurisdiction to carry out criminal investigations. If we look at the figure based on the recommendations of OLAF, which is the EU's leading anti-fraud body, the national authorities managed to prosecute only in 36% of European corruption cases. And less than 10% of the losses are actually recovered. So in order to have a common European approach in prosecution, a new institution, the European Public Prosecutor's Office, which I will call EPPO, is being set up. And this is really good news. How does it work? Each participating member state is going to be represented by delegate prosecutors who will coordinate the investigations at European level. And normally the EPPO should start operations in December, December this year, December 2020. However, um, there remains the uh, issue of its fragmented jurisdiction. Uh, EPPO's criminal prosecution's powers apply only in 22 of the 27 countries. In some countries, either by referendum or by governmental decision, and those countries are Denmark, Hungary, Ireland, Poland, and Sweden. So those countries have uh, opted out of cooperation in the field of justice. So the question is, and it's kind of your question, Emil. Is it okay to have states that are outside EPPO jurisdiction? Shouldn't it be, uh, shouldn't this be in a way or another a conditionality? 
Well, you know, it, we've been talking about this. It is still a matter of dispute as to whether the European funds should be conditional on the respect of the rule of the law, because it's going to be very complicated. At the same time, I really think that it would be fair and normal to condition disbursement of European funds on the member states' adherence to a credible system allowing efficient prosecution of fraud. Um, so in my view, this account the accountability that I'm talking about could include membership in the EPPO. Um, as, I, you know, as, the, as everybody knows, fighting corruption and fraud is a matter of security because the illicit proceeds of EU money are often used to finance international crime network. Uh, the obligation to recover misspent EU funds cannot be optional. And in conclusion, I think we should not tol uh, tolerate those loopholes. I mean, the existence of prosecution free havens where the EU is not allowed, basically is not allowed to intervene. Now we have this great instrument, instrument, the EPPO. And if a state receives European money, I think it needs to accept that the European prosecutor can investigate how the money was spent. That would be my... Uh, First answer and my contribution to this dialogue, Emily. Thank you, Clotilde. So you gave us some uh, perspectives, uh, this new institution, EPPO. You spoke uh, also about uh, the idea of uh, putting a limit to the size of the, uh, the farms in order to uh, get the uh, farm subsidies. Uh, we will continue this, uh, this debate now with uh, Francisco Guerrero. Uh, you are a member of the European Parliament also, and you belong to the Green Group. Uh, so if uh, we try to get more transparency in the funds uh, distribution, uh, should, we, uh, should we let the member states responsible for the administration of the aids? Uh, before Alex uh, talked a, a little bit about this, uh, this is a, a one of the contradiction of the uh, European policy. There is uh, the European level and then the member states who decide and who administrate uh, these, uh, these fundings. So it, that could be maybe a solution that the EU uh, should intervene more in the uh, uh, distribution of the aids or do you think that we should keep the system like this? Uh, hello, good morning to everyone. Um, thanks for Benoit Vito and his team for organizing this webinar. Also to, to Matt and Alex for ex expressing their points of view. They are really, really relevant and other speakers that are here with us. Uh, well, uh, I think your question was, was very straightforward. So I think, yes, we should change the way we use public money uh, through CAP, uh, having conditionality and trackability uh, through the national uh, countries so the member states so this for us is obviously and the the, the investigative journalism that is being made by Matt uh, and other journalists also by Emily uh, as I understood uh, in France uh, shows this uh, that uh, this public money is being uh, shared and used um, in a, a very um, not not uh, I, I won't say immoral way but uh, not um, not very straightforward way uh, and the data uh, the the few the, the few data that we have that the journalists have it's clear uh, I, I would also like to 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 point out that uh, we the greens have have been asking for a total reform of the cap and uh, this has not been uh, possible mainly because of some obstacles political obstacles for us it's clear that the, the objectives of the cap uh, are not uh, tackled with the climate uh, objectives that we have. Uh, also, the, the European Court of Auditors had several reports that stated that we are not spending this money wisely and we don't have the mechanisms to track and to, um, and to, to, to understand where the money is being applied. Uh, and so we also questioned the, the Agriculture Commission on an audition on how would he, would he um, how was he, his vision, how we would try to tackle this, this, this lack of trackability and track of regulation. And he said very, very clearly that he's very concerned that he would uh, make his, this his priority. But in the meanwhile, we haven't had anything concrete. So uh, what would, would be the commission's plan to, 
to make this trackability and accountability feasible. Um, we are also trying because the cap is is is, is ongoing. Also, uh, in the greens, uh, Benoit is, is is responsible of this file, so a huge huge effort that he has been making. Um, but we are trying also to to make some conditionalities, uh, mainly on the horizontal regulation, where we can have a specific uh, information on ownership to beneficiaries. So we have to know where this money is going because it's public, public money. And uh, obviously we have to have this trackability because uh, we think that's a co conditionality. If we don't know where the money is going, um, well, companies or individual farmers uh, should not receive this money. And also uh, Alex told us that uh, it's very important also for us to, to change 180 degrees the scope of where the, these investments uh, are, are going. Uh, if we have, uh, uh, and it, this is just a, a broader perception of the commission. If we only have 25% of the funds allocated to uh, the developments of, of climate goals, uh, this is not uh, feasible. Uh, even if even if we manage to, to tackle this 25%, it's not enough for us to use uh, this chunk of money that is a huge part of the MFF uh, funds to, to, to tackle climate change. So clearly, we won't be able to, to, to address the problems that are very well exposed on the one article of math that correlates the nitrate pollution with the water pollution, the, the, the intensive factory farming that is being held uh, also uh, in Europe and the degradation of the biodiversity. Um, on that uh, aspect, I would like to ask Matt if uh, first, if he's thinking about doing a report on Portugal. <laughs> He probably, he probably will have some surprises. Uh, uh, and uh, if he sees any correlations uh, with these funds that are being uh, directly uh, through the cap, uh, to intensive farming, to the degradation of uh, biodiversity, uh, in a general way, uh, more than just the birds and the nitrates. So they, it, it, he showed us that he could make like a, a correlation between data that he shows us uh, a part of the picture, but if he's concerned about the major picture, because this is also about soil degradation, uh, wildlife uh, extinction, uh, also correlated with the, the, um, the increase of factory farming, and also if he has some perspectives about animal welfare on the conditions of these farmed animals, or if it's just like a, a parallel, uh, a parallel uh, question, because also this this public money is being used to exploit animals in a, uh, a way that uh, Europeans are not uh, not fan of. Because the, the last year of Barometer said that more than 85% of the EU citizens are concerned about animal welfare and are willing to um, to change obviously their 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 ways of, of consuming and also the habits of producing food to a more sustainable and more welfare uh, animal standards so to elevate these standards. And for uh, Alex, if the, this type of, uh, of of changes in the horizontal regulation would be a good step forward to for us to, to try to tackle this this use uh, of, of public money, and if it's if it this trackability and accountability would be not enough, obviously, because there's there's several other points that have to be uh, uh, that have to be addressed. But if it, this could be a, a very positive approach to to try to use correctly the funds that are being channeled through CAP. Thank you very much to everyone. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, so there's a lot a lot to unpack there. And but the, to your first question, I don't think there's been a day in the last three months when I wouldn't have loved to have been on a farm in Portugal or pretty much anywhere else other than my home office. Um, but uh, but look, um, yes, of course the money goes to support big farmers because it's designed to do that, right? I mean, this is this is not a bug in the system. This is the system. It, it is, uh, this is a system that was designed after World War II to produce as much food as possible and protect against famine and uh and you know rather than overhaul it and start from scratch it's been sort of christmas it's got the christmas tree treatment like we'll hang hang an ornament over here we'll hang it over and over here we'll hang an ornament over here and it's sort of still ultimately the same system it's still meant to support big farmers um that's not right or wrong i mean i'm not i'm not making a value judgment on that 
that. Uh, I will say that traveling around uh, the, the EU last year and talking to a lot of farmers, it's the small and medium farmers who, uh, who really feel like they get screwed here. And, um, and they feel like, uh, you know, some, a good number of them mentioned what uh, Gerard uh, wrote in the comments section here a moment ago, which is this all would fix itself if, you know, uh, if food prices weren't artificially depressed, right? <clears throat> I'm not an economist. I don't know if that's true. A lot of people said this is a politically rigged system to keep the really politically connected wealthy farmers wealthy and politically connected. Um, but there's a real, there's a real, seems to be a real frustration among small farmers. Um, and to your point about uh, biodiversity and, and tracking, I mean, I, I will, I just will do this one thing here. Um, and uh, um, we had this, so there's, this is the, uh, the gray partridge and the gray partridge is a, it's called an, in, uh, an indicator species. So like when your partridge is doing well, it's pretty good sign that your, your biodiversity is in balance. Uh, like a 10% decline in the partridge population is a pretty good sign that something's seriously wrong. And in the Netherlands, we've seen like a 90% decline in the partridges. Uh, I, I'm not a bird person, so I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to advocate for the, for the partridge, but I'm saying scientists look at species like this as a measure of the health of the, uh, um, and this is like, this is what, what kind of the partridge needs to live in, this sort of something like this. And then, you know, grassland here. Uh, but, you know, if it looks like this, then where's the bird going to go, right? This isn't rocket science. Uh, and um, so the, again, if we had data that allowed us to look at subsidies, we would be able to say, how much of land like this are we subsidizing? And how much of land like this are we subsidizing? And um, we can't do that uh, because the data is not there. Um, but it is all tied together. This question of, of environment and the question of transparency, I mean, they very much go hand in hand. Alex, if you want to uh, intervene and uh, answer uh, to the previous question, briefly, if possible. <laughs> yeah, I will uh, respond. And uh, I, I believe this is an important discussion and there are very relevant observations and uh, good questions. And especially the last contribution about uh, um, animal welfare in the Netherlands is, uh, well, in, in, in extremely important. I have had another item with uh, investigative uh, journalists on this issue, and they show that all investment of Europe in uh, environment uh, does not have uh, any uh, measurable effect. So that, that is really an, an issue which uh, comes up. But uh, to cover some of the issues which are on the table, uh, I believe that Clotilde uh, asked the question, put the question, um, the size of the fund, the size of the funding. And uh, I believe this is a, a, an important question in the sense that maybe we should limit the idea of investment in agriculture as such, because it corresponds with the pictures that Francisco Guerrero has shown that do we want to transform uh, biodiversity uh, landscapes into acres? Do we want uh, huge production uh, entities in, uh, in agriculture or do we, uh, do we need uh, other structures? The second issue I would, touch, I would like to touch upon very briefly and it's the question of, of Apple and uh, also Olaf uh, in investigating uh, um, uh, fraud and corruption. I believe there's one European problem and that is that if things are not going well, we look at Brussels and the power of Brussels and to, uh, to uh, enlarge the, the, the competences of Brussels institutions like Apple. We must admit that Apple is to a large extent a failure. Uh, I, I'm very brief on it, but my uh, analysis of the start of Apple in the beginning was that all member states tried to distract everything which would uh, uh, help Apple to be a very powerful uh, public uh, prosecution uh, institution. But behind this, there is the most important question, and I, I mentioned it before, that is good governance and the rule of law. 
on member state level. If we fail in Europe to, to work on this issue, uh, uh, the development of uh, the European uh, project will be, uh, will be hindered severely. And I believe this also uh, relates with the issue of um, horizontal uh, uh, regulations in the sense that good administration, uh, good governance, the rule of law, these are quintessential elements of an, uh, a good uh, development uh, in, in Europe. But at the end of the day, I believe that we should in Europe work uh, into the direction of uh, a, a shift to sustainable development on member state level, on, on the level of uh, good administration, on the development of society, but also if it comes to agriculture and, uh, and other parts of, uh, of economy, the, 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 the local economy. And I believe this is the right time to make real important changes. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, uh, we have now a lot of uh, perspectives uh, and, and a lot of uh, ideas to reform the CAP. Maybe one more thing uh, that I would ask to Benoit Albito this time. So Benoit, uh, you belong to the Green Group in the European Parliament, and there is a thing that maybe we could also uh, explore. This is a calculation of the uh, European subventions. Um, until now, the direct aids are calculated on the surfaces of the agricultural lands, which was also a factor of the extension of the farms. Uh, does the fight against corruption imposes a change of this system and a new kind of calculation of the uh, farm subsidies? Merci Amélie de cette question. C'est le moment Merci. du repos ouais. du, de l'interprète en français euh, pour cinq ou six minutes. Euh, avant de répondre à ta question, Amélie, je, je, je souhaitais quand même revenir sur ce qu'a dit Alex tout à l'heure et sur le rôle des journalistes. Euh, rappeler. Get back to what uh, Alex said and the role of, of journalists. It's true that journalists have to feed democracy. Uh, Daphne Carvagna, uh, fate in, in Malta, for instance, has lost her life during that process. And uh, Matt, um, you've worked extensively around uh, this topic. So it's fair to say that journalists play uh, a very important role in this. And Matt's investigation for the New York Times uh, merely illustrates this. Then to get back to uh, Emily's question, when we study Matt's work into detail, we, we see that he clearly shows how uh, corruption and uh, environmental challenges are closely intertwined. On the maps he showed, we have seen that uh, the bulk of the uh, cap money um, is subject to uh, practices um, which, which uh, are closely linked to corruption. And often we also see the same beneficiaries showing up. Corruption, climate change, uh, environmental challenges uh, are overlapping, in my opinion. And to tackle, uh, to respond to Emily's question, um, distribution of the money based on surfaces has not excluded the corruption and the deterioration of environmental and climatic uh, circumstances. We therefore need to review uh, the whole system because currently what we see is that cannibalism is uh, being promoted in, in uh, agriculture. The more surface you have, the more public money you can get. And that has led to the, the construction of these huge mega farms. Um, I'm sure. Well, of course, there, there's all, all sorts of uh, financial constructions with shell companies uh, which are hiding behind this and covering up the system. And this whole system has um, made the, the small farmers disappear. 
uh, as, as Clotilde mentioned, for instance, uh, in, in the Romanian countryside, because those small farmers uh, are unable to, to survive based on their farming activities. In France, for instance, 50% of the farmers have disappeared over the past uh, 50 years, oh, over the past 20 years, sorry. And behind every agricultural surface, there's public money. And in many cases, the, the big landowners do not make this land available for smaller farmers to establish their farms there. So we have to rethink the way in which we distribute the public monies. There's not enough conditionality. We have to heed Matt's words. If we want to aim for biodiversity, if we want to safeguard, or if we want to avoid rather practices which uh, destroy the environment, then we have to build in conditionality and not simply talk about uh, balance. I think conditionality should be a condition uh, or should be built in as of the first euro of public money which is uh, being uh, paid. Um, so projects, every project needs um, criteria for biodiversity and protection against climate change. We need pro um, projects that uh, protect our environment, our public health, they make sure that we breathe healthy air. All of that is quite self-evident. And in order to administratively simplify the, the uh, cap, it could be feasible or should be feasible to, to find easy parameters for the distribution of these public monies. So uh, simple parameters, um, not based on surface, but for instance, based on um, labor. And that could also be tied to what Clotilde said, um, where we maintain the agricultural social tissue. Those indicators could be easily achieved. We could also build in indicators linked to climatological and environmental challenges before we distribute the public monies. And that way, the both challenges uh, could converge. So uh, the environment on the one hand, which uh, is uh, becoming increasingly important and which was uh, highlighted by the whole COVID crisis. Um, we could also cap it, of course. I'm not excluding that because there are huge uh, structures, industrial structures, which uh, also create uh, labor. And that uh, we shouldn't be blind for either. But we need more manpower to reach those objectives. And therefore, we need good indicators to, to work in that direction. Then the national rules um, in, in France, for instance, we've seen that uh, we, we didn't have enough um, means to protect our own French soil. The Chinese are currently purchasing vast amounts of land. Um, then national aid, and this was also highlighted by COVID. But some countries, for instance, uh, the Netherlands, uh, give national aid for agricultural reforms. There's no caps, and this has led to a distortion uh, between the member states, between the richer countries in Western Europe and the poorer countries in, in Eastern Europe. And we see that those national aids continue to contribute to differences between certain member states of the European Union. The convergence of aid is uh, another main objective of uh, the CAP. And to wrap it up, uh, I think uh, the battle hasn't been fought yet. And in 2013, for instance, the Greens have had tabled uh, a number of amendments to achieve more transparency in the uh, common agricultural policy. We have to relaunch that work, that initiative. 
we have to keep fighting this battle, hoping to win it. I think um, times are changing, um, and Matt's work has helped us to shed light onto this whole shady business. And um, Alex uh, men, uh, used a very interesting formula there. We could definitely use it. And I think it's high time we aim for change. And that's it. Thank you. of a big uh, cap reform, uh, a profound one, and not just a superficial uh, measure. Uh, we, now we have a lot of questions for, uh, coming from our audience. So I will start with uh, this one, which is a topic that uh, we didn't speak about. Um, this is a question uh, related to the, um, uh, the agreements, uh, the global uh, agreements. So I, I'm just reading the question. Subsidies uh, have been created with CAP reform uh, 1992, linked with the GATT uh, um, World Trade Organization Agreement, where EU farm prices started to be decreased to international farm prices and replaced by subsidies. Isn't time to question this for new fair trade rules and supply management to strongly reduce farmers' dependency from subsidies? Who wants to under this uh, among the deputies, members of parliament? Uh, the floor. I, it's not about less aid. I don't have uh, any issue with uh, giving public funding to certain activities and we're talking about agriculture here and the main purpose of agriculture is to produce food so i don't have any issue with that what i have an issue with is the way in which these public monies are distributed and that ties to the question of, of conditionality it sh should be linked to certain activities with a social purpose, but also with um, biodiversity and, and climate aspects. Scientists can um, elucidate us on, on certain topics which have to do with the agriculture, public health and others. This is a transversal topic and, topic, and this is probably also why it represents 60% of uh, the EU budget. And that's why we're also entitled to build in certain conditionalities and to monitor how these public monies are being distributed. And the money has to go to uh, challenges which have to do with the future of our society and the future of uh, our generations. And conditionality is needed uh, to further this. I think we uh, need to establish a clear vision. What's the dream we have? What's the objective for the agricultural world? I hear you talk about uh, conditionality. I am uh, strongly in favor of this and uh, the rule of law is also crucial for me when we talk about conditionality and projects uh, at the farmers level and if we ask these farmers to submit all sorts of uh, paperwork then the results are clear we will kill the countryside the countryside shall no longer exist because Romanian farmers for instance uh, will not be able to submit uh, all those uh, projects in uh, the language required by Brussels. So the countryside will not be able to absorb all the monies that are available. And the same goes for Bulgaria and Croatia. There's plenty of countries that don't simply don't speak the Brussels language, the Brussels lingo. So again, what's the objective we want to pursue? The objective of this uh, cap was to 
um, make sure that European farming, European agriculture was competitive at the world level. But we have to look at the whole world of agriculture. Uh, the West has its challenges. Uh, countries such as Romania and, and Bulgaria uh, are at the other far end, and, and France and the Netherlands are, are somewhere in the middle. Uh, and I'm sure that some of their uh, agricultural businesses will also have issues submitting those projects. But we have to take into account the diversity and we have to develop uh, a system that meets these requirements. Um, Benoit mentioned something about aid linked to the number of, uh, of uh, workers. Uh, in that case, I'm uh, afraid that certain parts of the countryside will uh, cease to exist. Uh, the farmers will simply sell off their land and migrate, and they will abandon their dream the dream of farming in Europe, and that will no longer then exist. And Europe has to take into account uh, the differences between the various countries. And we have to wonder whether we will allow this to play or not. The ads, but about reforming them. Uh, but Can make a quick we comment on that as well? Uh, at least, just a second now, uh, at least the uh, agriculture sector in Europe still needs subventions. I have another question coming from uh, the people that are following us, which is uh, quite interesting uh, related to the uh, COVID context. Um, because we saw during the uh, epidemic uh, that uh, actually the uh, European agriculture is depending from the workforce coming from other countries. And also, Clotilde, you mentioned that before, and maybe you will be interested also to under this. Uh, we saw that a lot of uh, the main uh, CAP beneficiaries, uh, like Germany, Italy, France, uh, are also countries that employ a lot of uh, uh, workers, uh, seasonal workers, and uh, sometimes uh, with the help of criminal organizations. Uh, we have the recent cases in Germany where farmers and their partners cheat workers at payment and do not respect the COVID protection conditions for the workforce. Uh, also some cases in Sicily uh, uh, were, were observed. Uh, so a question for, for you, uh, the uh, MAPs. What would be your proposals to stop these practices from the EU level? Lara, maybe, or Clotilde? Uh, do you want to answer this? Um, I think I think this is a, a question maybe of, of labor law or um, the posting of workers directive rather than of, of uh, the, the, the cap. Um, but I suppose, I mean, the, the, the answer will, will partly lie in, in enforcement. I think now that we're aware of these practices, um, there, uh, there are more checks. There were cases in the Netherlands as well. Um, of seasonal workers um, who, were, who were all packed together. Um, I think it was in this case in a, in a meat processing plant. But um, so I think I think uh, further further checks. And I think that if if you zoom out, I mean, this is still a question to do with uh, inequality within the EU. I mean, this is you know labor migration is is still to do with us not getting our our convergence entirely right. And maybe you know also a question of of cohesion policy in 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 some uh, sense. Um, the other thing I wanted to say previously on the question of, of subsidies and the future of subsidies, um, I, I don't agree either that this should be the, the end of subsidies. I think that um, we should be grateful to the farmers who make it possible for us you know, to walk into a supermarket and, and get our dinner on the table um, very quickly. But I think um, the changes do need to be made, as, as all, all other colleagues have said. But one part in that, I think, is that we do also need to try to cut the political ties between policymakers and um, and the communities they represent, and I don't mean that in the sense of you know we need to stop anyone who knows a bit about agriculture from going into politics. But I think Matt described you know what happened with Viktor Orban and um, the the people he surrounded himself with, and then ended up giving land to very well. Um, and I just wanted to, to mention there as a little bit of a controversial topic perhaps, but that in the Budget Control Committee, um, I tabled an amendment on um, members of the Agri Committee uh, 
um, and saying basically that, that we shouldn't allow members of the Agriculture Committee who have farms, so ones that are still actively farming, or at least who have um, farms to, to, their, to their name or their family, um, to be able to decide also directly on, on income support. And that was met with a lot of resistance um, within the parliament, um, within my, my own group even. So I'd also be grateful to get um, other people's views because I think if we do want to get the future of subsidies right, um, then we do also need to look at conflicts of interest within our own house. Uh, Amélie, uh, pour que je réponde rapidement à la question, je pense que sur le... le I think for the seasonal workers who uh, often uh, work and travel in difficult circumstances and are often uh, ill-treated. Well, they, they uh, go there for, for harvesting or other agricultural practices. And sometimes we see that entire villages are, are mobilized and uh, those workers uh, know who to turn to. If um, they are replaced by two or three workers employing massive giant machines, then there will be a problem with agricultural workers as well, with manpower. This uh, issue has to do with the model, the business model we chose for agriculture. Um, we plead for uh, a family model where the whole village is involved and where everybody lends a hand. If we abandon that model, then it will be difficult to find uh, agricultural workers because uh, the, the whole agriculture becomes dehumanized. As Lara mentioned, we have to, uh, of course, take care of the working conditions of those workers, but what we especially need to find out is the type of agriculture. Yes. Very we briefly, advocate. and then we'll have a last question, and then it will be the end, unfortunately. <laughs> please, Benoit, please. Je voulais juste répondre à Lara parce que parce que moi je fais partie des gens, je ne m'en cache pas, hein, qui, qui, je suis agriculteur et, et je siège en commission agri. Euh, juste pour euh, peut-être la rassurer euh, et peut-être pas faire de, de généralité parce que l'agriculture, ou en tout cas la PAC, la politique agricole commune que je défends moi, euh, est une politique agricole commune qui dessert ma propre structure. C'est-à-dire que euh, si, si la, la PAC telle que je la défends, moi, parce que je pense que c'est comme ça qu'on doit la distribuer, dans l'intérêt commun, parce que moi, je, je pense qu'il faut, qu faut avancer vers la convergence, il faut entendre ce que nous raconte Clotilde sur ce qui se passe en Roumanie. Je pense que nous, les pays comme la France, doivent euh, délester un peu de notre PAC pour aller accompagner ces pays-là pour euh, avancer vers la convergence. Et donc, la PAC que je défends aujourd'hui est extrêmement pénalisante sur ma structure personnelle. Donc, euh, force est de constater que, que dans cette commission-là, et, et j'en suis un, un exemple, il y a des gens qui défendent l'intérêt commun et qui ont mis de côté leur propre euh, intérêt euh, personnel euh, et, et sont prêts à, à, accès, à consentir une baisse euh, importante de leurs aides pour euh, servir une PAC qui serve l'intérêt commun euh, sur l'Union européenne. Ok, maybe a last question uh, and then we will have to uh, finish this uh, discussion, uh, unfortunately. Um, coming back to the European news, uh, there were some announcements about uh, the Green Deal uh, recently and about the farm to fork strategy. And there is now a, a question from uh, someone who is following us uh, about this, uh, this uh, strategy. Uh, is it a, 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 good, uh, a good instrument? Uh, that this will be done with uh, an instrument targeted result-based payments called eco schemes. Uh, what do you think of this new instrument as a solution and that could help maybe uh, to be to have an agriculture uh, more uh, um, well uh, better for the environment uh, maybe who wants to answer this Benoit or uh, uh, but you, you already spoke a lot <laughs> so I don't know Francisco maybe I beaucoup parlé, mais je vais, je vais être très bref, uh, yeah, I spoke a lot but I'll be uh, brief because most of it has been said uh, unfortunately this whole eco scheme is still based uh, on the same system namely surfaces 
and we need to change our way of thinking in order to establish or to bring about change. I've already given a number of answers uh, before. As long as there's no conditionality and we stick to uh, the, the surfaces, these echo schemes will okay, not be Okay, one more reaction uh, before we close this uh, debate. Alex, you should say something about the eco schemes because the auditors have looked at uh, of eco schemes. Well, very briefly, uh, I believe that this uh, development may support the change I, uh, I have been uh, advocating, the change from service-based uh, subsidies in the direction of project-based uh, subsidies and investments. And I believe that the Green Deal should be based on um, the fin financing sound projects, which have a measurable and, and uh, proven results in, instead of just putting money into, well, whatever in, in Europe, in having, having territory, agricultural uh, territory, etc. Thank you, uh, Alex. Thank you very much to everybody who participated in this uh, discussion. Um, it was really interesting and I see that uh, you have a lot of work, all of you. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Ciao. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you to bye -bye. your work. Thank you so much. Thank you.